is the West Side King's Church podcast, where we aim to encounter and embody the surprising grace of Jesus. Well, Phil, it's really good to be, I was going to say with you, but I'm still stuck in quarantine, uh, for which you had to cover for me on Sunday morning. So formally, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure, man. Pleasure. I mean, not pleasure that you're sick, but glad to be able to step in for sure. <laughs> and so what we want to do in, in this podcast, which is it's kind of just working through this How to Be a, a Church series, is, is create a little bit of space for two things, really. One, which is, you know, what did you not get to in the sermon? What did you cut at the last minute? What did you hope mm. to say but not get around to say? And then also maybe just to unpack in a little more detail or perhaps a little more thoroughly some of the questions that we had during during the dialogical part of the sermon. So mm. let's sort of jump in just conversationally then, Phil, to the first part. Even though I, I think you only de- <laughs> I only asked you on Thursday to teach on Sunday, I'm pretty certain not everything made the cut. So, <laughs> so never if I, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so what I was um, thinking was you know, I, I loved how you, you sort of built on the questions of, of being centered set by asking this question, what is God like? And hmm. I, uh, you know, here's just some of my reflections on your sermon really well. You think about what do you want to jump in and, and unpack that you, that you did cut. But I loved, I, and I couldn't help but reflecting afterwards, and I even tweeted a little bit about this, how yeah. that question, what is God like? is actually a question that Jesus spends a lot of time thinking about in his parables. Like so many of the, of the parables of Jesus yes. are an answer, uh, not the answer, but are an answer to the question, what is God like? And, and I find myself reflecting, well, why don't we, when, when we hear that question, what is God like? And we all start scrambling going, I don't know. Why isn't it that the parables come immediately to mind? So then I started reflecting and realized, I wonder if it's because... <laughs> When Jesus does explain what God's like in a parable, it's often quite controversial, isn't it? Mm, it's often, mm. and, and it's often quite centered set, right? So I, the first yeah. one I was drawn to is the vineyard workers. You know, there's some people work all day, there's some people don't work much at all. And guess what? They all get they all get wages from this vineyard owner. So, so I mean, not to ask you to comment on my my musings on Twitter, but. But I mean, where 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 do you find yourself on that? And the parables of Jesus and the question of what God is like. Oh yeah, stunning. I mean, I I think the parables. The beautiful thing about them is the open ended nature of them. Now, I've had mm. some people suggest almost that, hey, on any controversial issue, we should just do what Jesus did and and talk in parables. But then I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but at the at the end of the day, they still wanted to kill him. So, you know, they're, they're still problematic. But yeah, the you know, the the vineyard worker, all of these, they're, they're super provocative. And mm. so I think the things that Jesus says, you know, I, I'm actually kind of shocked that I never brought this up because it, it's what Jesus said, also who Jesus is, Brian mm. Zond, right? I mean, is, is very famous for saying, you know, what is God like? God is like Jesus. God has always yes. been like Jesus. We yeah. haven't always known this, but now we do. And this is kind of his his classic thing. And so I, I didn't yes. get into that very much other than to kind of open that, that question, which is interesting because I think so many times people don't think through that question. But, you know, yeah. it's like even when Jesus was kind of physically around you know philip says lord show us the father that'll be enough for us <laughs> and jesus <laughs> basically rebukes him says don't you know don't you know me philip like how how long have i been with you anybody who has yeah. seen me has seen the father yeah. and so there's a way in which um like what is jesus like okay well or what is god like rather well we look to jesus and then we can't separate what jesus said and what jesus did so I love, you know, the the parabolic nature of what which you brought in because these parables, the parables are not always clean cut, right? They're these, you know, what is God like? And it seems in some ways to be a contradiction of like, well, God is like this, oh, and like that, and like mm. a man who threw manure around a tree and like <laughs> yeah. you you're going, "What?" But it, but shouldn't shouldn't the question on some level, on some level I think the question is answerable. God mm. is like Jesus. On the other, on the other end, it's this thing like in the parables 
that I think we have to wrestle with our whole mm. It's not a question that, what is God like? Well, next week we're going to tell you in a sermon mm. and then you won't have to ever ask it again. No, it's more like the parables <laughs> in mm-hmm. which Jesus said, God is like this and this and this and this. And now you have to wrestle with the implications for the rest of your life. So I, th- I thought it was a brilliant thing you did there on Twitter. I, I loved when I, when I saw that. Yeah, and, and I love how that idea is so consistent throughout Scripture, actually, as well, that you mentioned that Zahn says it. I first encountered the idea in my postgraduate work, actually, from uh, Morna Hooker, the professor of divinity at Cambridge. And she had just this phrase where she said, all theology is Christology. Right. So, yes. uh, you know, and, and now the thing is for people, I think it sounds heretical when you first hear it, right? That, that nothing you can know about God can be bigger than what you know about Jesus. You think, well, no, that can't be, that can't be right. <laughs> there must be more to God than there is Jesus. But then, like you say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Hebrews, I think, is the great text on this for me, is, you know, that Jesus is the, is the perfect likeness of, 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 of God. This is, you know, Jesus is God revealed to us. And that's not to move away from notions of Trinity or, or God's being or anything of like course. that. It's actually just to live within Scripture. That this yeah. is God revealed to us, isn't it? Yes. And, and yet so often we, we go, we almost live, and I, th- I think to be fair, I understand why we've ended up there, because sometimes we've been taught it like this, that like Jesus is the nice bit of God, and then there's this other idea of God that's bigger out there where all of the 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 boundary making and the law making comes from and, and, and oh, yeah. i think that might be why we get stuck in this centered set model because i think you go well jesus seems to fit the centered set model i get that he seems to call people to follow me but but what about the god of the old testament right or what about you know the the god that you know you talked about this on sunday you know what about the god that 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 threatens everyone with hell or what about and and these these sort of questions seem valid if you've not really been rooted in the idea that jesus is what god is like Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, David, as you're saying that, one of the things that comes to mind, I've been writing, reading and writing a lot on mystery. And the Christian understanding of mystery is not a puzzle to be solved. You know, there's there's some great Boyer and Hall write write on that. I'm trying to think of the first names anyway. Nobody cares. (laughs) Boyer and Hall, they, they write on this. And, you know, one of the things that they say is God is... God is not investigative mystery. God mm-hmm. is revelational mystery. Mm-hmm. And but I th- and so you know you get into that. God is ever expanding it. Like we never figure God out. I think one of the dangers of when we talk about Jesus is, oh, but at last we have Jesus who has finally solved the mystery of God, and now <laughs> it all makes sense to us. Rather than living in like, well, no. <laughs> mm. Jesus Jesus is not the Jesus shows us what God is like. Jesus reveals himself, reveals what God is like, and yet remains before us as as mystery as well, forever drawing us in and expanding our hearts and expanding our minds. Mm. And I think this is part of the center set idea is that we don't have just a stable list of you know at last we have these 25 things and if you Mm -hmm. understand these you understand god and maybe we didn't before Mm -hmm. but now that we have jesus now we finally do and so it's easy don't you know transgress this do transgress yes you know like it's oh no 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 (laughs) jesus is alive and active and drawing us and expanding us and blowing our minds continually and so i think that's the thing for me even with the parables that they bring us back to that of this they're not the parables sit with us forever, right? They're not these mm. puzzles to be solved. They're these things to live into, kind of as, as you were saying. So, yeah, fascinating stuff. Anyway. I mean, I, you know, I'm gonna, I want to push that uh, further even, and we're going to have to podcast about this somewhere else at some point, Phil. But, mm. you know, you and I are both read an Andrew Root's book, uh, latest yes. book <laughs> on churches and the crisis of decline. But, but he's yeah. got me thinking about a few things that, that I can't help but just immediately be drawn to in what you, what you said just there. So... There's this sense that there's the 25 things. I want the 25 things to create a book to go, here's the 25 things that you need to know about Jesus. Yep. And invariably the subtitle is so that you can be in and okay. And I mean, that's not a <laughs> subtitle, but essentially totally. it's something like that. If you know the 25 things you're in, if you don't know the 25 things you're out, right? And now 
Root talks a lot in his book about this tension between knowing and being and having yes. and how what we tend to want to do within the modern world is we want to have everything. You know, it's I need to own it. It needs to be mine. I want the 25 things. It's 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 actually we've not progressed beyond beyond Moses saying to God, well, tell me your name and I might I might do this. Right? I, yeah, I need yeah. to have possession. Interestingly, that's what the Satan offers Jesus in one of the temptations is here, look at all this stuff. You can have it if you just worship yeah. me. And Jesus is like, yeah, but I, you know, he doesn't, I mean, a long story, we could talk about that, but Jesus rejects the invite to have and in cha- instead chooses to be, the, you know, the son of God, actually. Now, I was thinking about how we want to have things, but instead we're invited into mystery. <laughs> and the, one yeah. of the problems with mystery is it's very hard I'm probably just in some rudimentary thoughts here that you've processed a long time ago, so can help me with. But the but one of the things about mystery is you can't own it. It's you know Paul Paul even says this in Ephesians, and I, I make known a mystery. <laughs> you know, so it's yeah, like, right, 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 hey, right. I'm going to make something known. What are you going to make known? Well, it's a bit of a mystery, right? It's, <laughs> so yes, it's made known, but it's kind of also not made known. So now, what do you know? Well, I know there is a mystery. That's my progress is. I now know that there's stuff that I, I don't know. I now know that there's stuff that I can't own, have, hold. And so there's something about being able to... Well, let me, let me try and articulate this better now because that was a lot of waffle. One of the things that is nice about owning something is you own it, you have your 25 things, and you know where the fence goes. <laughs> yep. Whereas where I like the idea of centered set is it says to you who used to be out, me who used to be in... What about embracing this mystery of the Jesus who's drawing us all towards him and all of yes. us are aware of the mystery? Does that, yeah, I mean, does yeah. that resonate for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, th- I think that there's something here that resonates with, with others as well, where it, you know, I mean, David, you know, I'm, I'm involved in, in multi-faith work. Like I had, I had somebody... Okay, maybe this maybe it's the podcast where I'll get myself in trouble. But <laughs> <laughs> I I had a student come to me once, and it was a you know a mature student, and sat with me, said you know I've recently come back to faith in the past few years, and and you know I'm really happy, you know in my faith I still have questions, and we were set kind of toward the latter end of the pandemic, you know masks mm-hmm. on in the room, nobody's at the school, who says like, what I don't get though like. Do you think all your all your coworkers are like I just don't understand how you can think all your coworkers are going to hell? And I'm like I've never I've never even thought of this. I talk with my coworkers about hell. Mm-hmm. Or about Jesus rather, and not about hell. And there is something compelling, even with people of other faiths, as you begin to talk about Jesus. And I think that one of the things that you begin to realize is that these these lines that we've drawn mm-hmm. Even the ones that we think are very, very dangerous, and pro- and in some like I don't want to downplay some of this stuff, but the compelling nature of Jesus, and again, and I think this is part of what I am trying to move towards is when we talk about Jesus, it is not the theology of Jesus. We are talking about the person of Jesus who is alive and active amongst us now. So. <clears throat> you know, th- think about this, and I, ho- I hope I'm not taking your your question too far afield here. But like, for me, growing up, you know, one of these one of these lines would be, and I understand this line, and, and like theologically, it it is, and all of this kind of stuff, okay. But is like paganism. But have you ever talked with a pagan? And so for me, in my center, again, you know, like <laughs> cut this from the podcast. Feel free. I've talked with some who ended up going to a Pentecostal church came back and talked to me and said, I was like utterly blown away. And I said, talk to me about this. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? They're like, the whole reason I got into this is because I believe that there had to be something more than ideas, that there had to be an experience of the spiritual in the world. So, do I embrace their ideas of paganism? No, I do not. <laughs> What's fascinating, however, is when they went to a place where I largely thought, particularly working in an academic institution, oh, people mm-hmm. are going to be freaked out about this. They came back and said, we have to talk 
this idea of experiencing Jesus, of of the Spirit of God moving now, like mm-hmm. this is the thing we were hungering for. And so I think, you know, to get kind of to the latter part of your question is the lines just don't make any sense where I work in a lot of in a lot of ways right this doesn't mean that we don't have to talk about doctrine is is important again it's not like i'm saying it doesn't matter if you're a pagan or a christian that's not the point my Mm. point is simply that when i talk about jesus with the with with different people of very very different backgrounds there's still something captivating about the mystery of jesus not about the lines not about the the theology i think comes later but at first they've had, you know, I, I read somebody this week referred to it as a tap on the shoulder, <laughs> mm, like mm. God taps them on the shoulder and something awakens in them. And mm. I've witnessed this in people who it was like, hey, stay away. Don't talk with them. They're dangerous people. And then when you actually talk to them, they're like, oh, I went to one of your churches and goodness, this idea of, of this is actually what we're searching for, what we're thirsting for, Mm. or what we were when we got into something which would be vastly different than what we believe. It's my point that it doesn't matter. No, that's not my point. My point is that Jesus himself is still deeply compelling and is still Mm. breaking the lines down and drawing people to himself. That's That to me is where the life is, is I believe, goodness, you and I, you know, I, I say you and I, David, I mean, you're, you know, you have your PhD, but, you know, we care deeply about theology. We care deeply about belief, mm. about all these things, but goodness, we, we care about the God of the, of the belief. I think mm. this is what I didn't get For to sure. Sunday, but, you know, the mm. God, the God who we met before we ever read maybe a book, that yes. God is is moving well beyond the lines of the people that we encounter and the people who may be vastly different from us Mm. that same god is speaking and drawing and compelling belief matters you know it's like i I, i'm Mm. i'm overstating everything i'm saying here because i you know i don't want people walking away thinking wow phil's saying you know it doesn't matter if you're a pagan or a christian this is obviously not what i'm saying what i'm (laughs) saying is the line is not a barrier to Jesus. <laughs> That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. Is is yeah. Jesus is Jesus will transgress every one of our lines mm. to draw everyone to Himself because He loves them all. You know. Anyway, I, I fear I've digressed far far you know too much on your question but yeah <laughs> but no but that, that but that's exactly what we want to do, isn't it? And, and it strikes me as you're as you're saying that you know I like. Galatians Galatians 4 verse 8 right so you know formerly when you did not know God you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods and then verse 9 Paul says but now that you know God or rather are known by God how yes. is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces yes right? so, yes yes so, yes yes so, so, so this to me is the is, is is the question is again is and maybe it's all in this range of wells and fences and that is that if we if we work out the process that says i'm the one who has to find jesus right then then what we end up creating is religious mechanism right and yep. and 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 if that is the only way for it to happen then i would argue that christianity is probably your best bet to do that right yep. but however <laughs> what paul now says is to the galatians is actually it's not that you know god it's that god knows you right if yes. there is if there is a finding going on, and this goes, you know, back to Luke 15, I say back to Luke 15, I am involved in a discussion online about Luke 15 at the moment, so <laughs> that, that's what's also going on there. But, yeah. but notice in Luke 15, the, the, the active party is not the one who is lost, but is the one who is finding. You know, the, yeah. the, you know, the shepherd looks for the sheep, the woman looks yes. for the coin, the, the father sees the son at a distance and makes a way for him to come back. And so, so it, Jesus is compelling because Jesus is finding us. He's looking for us. And, and he might find you in Christianity, and he might find you in all these other places as well. But I think wherever Jesus finds you, he's going to draw you towards himself. Right? So Absolutely. My turn to say don't hear what I'm not saying in that. You know, <laughs> just you know, but but just 
I think what what we're saying there is actually profoundly biblical. It, it's absolutely at the center of the Bible, but so often we disempower Jesus and say that, no, no, he can't find you. Your only hope is to find him if you follow our rules, cross our fences, jump our hurdles. Uh, and yeah. I would just much much more love to be the type of community wherein we say, hey, you know, we're a group of people who have been found by Jesus. And when we gather together, we want to experience him. And when we go out into our workplaces and lives, we want to experience him there as well. We are, you know, we're like, oh, it totally makes sense. I, and and the Luke 15 thing is, is brilliant. I think all the time of, oh goodness, Peter Rollins. Okay. So like interesting Mm -hmm. character, (laughs) interesting thoughts. (laughs) But one of the things that he, you know, I read years and years ago that he said is like, like a baby, a baby who has, you know, a newborn has no kind of intellectual knowledge, can't communicate, can't speak, but the baby is being shaped by being held by its mother. And this is Mm. such a great picture of us with God. It's not that we have grasped God, but we are being grasped by God Mm. and therefore being changed. And, you know, the Luke 15 thing, this could probably lead us a little bit into the harrowing of hell question, which Mm. I botched on Sunday, but, (laughs) you know, hilariously botched, actually. But, you know, the, the, the ending piece, we focus so much on the one son coming Mm. home that we go we miss the fact that not only you know we talk about the elder brother but what about the father the father Mm -hmm. actually leaves the party Mm -hmm. which is often a picture of heaven leaves the feast leaves the party to go and be with the rebellious uh, in this case very religious type person Mm -hmm. to try and compel that person that Mm -hmm. son Come in, come in. You you have never you have never understood me because it's mm. always been about the boundaries for you. But the yeah. fact that the father leaves the party is it's just a stunning thing to me. Mm. We'll even leave the party for the religious. And this is the I think this is the the other piece of this, right? Is it's easy for us to talk, easy for I'll, I'll put I'll say me easy for me to talk about the way that I see the spirit working in the pagan or in the Hindu Mm. student or whatever. But the way that God, we also witness God at work is with the religious person who begins to say, goodness, you know, Mm. I don't even know how to relate to a God without fences and walls anymore. Mm. God has transgressed these and now I don't even know what to do. And the, you know, God's mercy is so wide that not only is God you know, after the religious other mm. pursuing them, but is also pursuing us who who have held to our our fences, even at the mm. expense of our brother. Yeah. Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's like the parables are a triggering <laughs> subject for me. So, you know, like th- think all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. I mean, bear in mind, I mean, just bear in mind for a second, this isn't a true story, right? So right, so, yeah. so, 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 Jesus is choosing the words of the religious brother, right? So yes. these are carefully curated words to make a point, like as in Jesus saying, this is what the religious person sounds like, right? To, to the father, the God character. But so, right. so, so, so the religious person says to the God, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and you never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat that I could celebrate with my friends. Right? But then look at the father's response: You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Right? Mm. And I just I had this revolutionary moment in my life, Phil. First year seminary class in a Greek class, the the lecturer said. He read this line, you know, uh, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. And and the lecturer just paused, and he just said, and that's true. <laughs> and and I had this wow. moment of realizing, yeah, it's true because the other half of everything's been blown. Like there's there's nothing mm. left. This young this so this son owns everything, right? It's mm. all his, and and he won't even take a goat to celebrate. He wants the the father to give him the goat. But the goat's his, wow. right? But he won't take it. So he lives this entirely boundaried life completely pointlessly. <laughs> it's all his. He can do whatever he wants with it. He can welcome everyone. But he mm. can't even allow himself to celebrate something of it. Yes, yes. I mean, just, <laughs> it's just stunning. But this is what religion, all religion, 
I, and by the way, let me state, I am not a religion is bad person. I think there's so much good in religion, much of which we need to recover. At the same time, there's also nothing maybe more dangerous than religion that, that we need to, you know, look at this and say, okay, my goodness, he had all the things and yet couldn't even live in them. And so this, this kind of stunning thing happening here, you know, I think David, one of the one of the things I didn't cover someday, which I think, you know, we never have time to, to do all these things, but I was reading Abraham Heschel on, on Saturday and I thought, well, I, you know, okay, it's too, it's too late to put this in. I mean, there were so many things that even, even the, even Jesus beginning, you know, I mentioned it briefly about asking for a drink to begin with before offering the water, I think is a stunning thing. Yeah. Amazing. um, An amazing thought. Oh my goodness. Just, just, wild and and I've you know I've preached on that text a number of times but it's just kind of the stunning thing that happens but I was reading Heschel the day before where he's talking about you know depth theology he calls it and and he says this you know like why why is it the beliefs why is it that the dogmas all these things why are they important and and this is the thing because you know it's not like we've been going out saying what do you believe? This none of this is important. Rather, we're just saying there's there's a deeper thing happening here. And mm-hmm. toward the end of the sermon, and this this is the beginning of this. This is the thing. This is the beginning and the end of it all. Mm-hmm. Is the question: Do you love Jesus? Do you love God? Heschel says this. He said, you know, why are dogmas necessary? Because he's talking about the, his whole thing about depth theology is like it's this pre theology. It's this thing that happens before theology. Theology is what we believe. Depth theology, as he calls it, is this thing, is the act of believing, the thing that happens in us before we ever kind of pencil out the beliefs. And he says, uh, we, can, we cannot be in rapport with the reality of the divine except for rare fugitive moments. And I've, I've seen him write other places of these encounters with God being like lightning in the night, where in the depth of the night, all of a sudden, for a brief second, everything lights up. You can see everything with absolute clarity, and then it's gone almost immediately, right? Yeah. And he says, this is the encounter with God in the soul, and but they are, you know, rare and fugitive moments. And he says this, dogmas are like the amber in which bees, once alive, are embalmed and which are capable of being electrified when our minds become exposed to the power of the ineffable. In other words, the, the thing of which we have for no, no words but are grasped by, as we were saying. For the problems with which we must always grapple are how to communicate those rare moments of insight to all hours of our lives right? Mm. This thing that we felt before we even knew how to put words to it. How can that come, you know, to give insight to all the hours of our lives, how to commit intuition to concepts, the ineffable words, communion to rational understanding, how to convey our insights to others, and how to unite in a fellowship of faith. It is the creed that attempts to answer these problems. And so I think the thing here is that it's not that the, these things are deeply important. Like we care about belief. We recite the creeds every, every week. There are things that we, beliefs that we have staked our lives on. But what he says is Mm -hmm. these are birthed from the very experience of God who is changing our hearts. The belief Mm -hmm. comes after, after the experience. And so this is where for me, it's, Theology is all response. <laughs> it's it's response to what God has already done. And so, you know, I think that's the thing that I would have dealt with is before we ever even had, and this is why I mentioned, you know, people of other religions, there's already something happening in them in which mm. Jesus is drawing them. And then later yes. on, what we do is attempt to name it. How dangerous then to make the naming of the thing that God did in us before we even knew God's name, perhaps, mm. to put a fence around it that keeps others who don't know God's name away yeah. from God, um, yes. rather than electrifying that thing in us to welcome others in and say, let's tell you about Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, you know, all of these mm. things. I love that. And, and, and I think that's, like, I, I have this, this thing that I hold to very strongly, and, and people 
disagree with me a lot on this. So, but <laughs> I see people disagree with me, right? But Fleming Rutledge seems to agree with me on this, and so did Carl mm. Barth. So, I feel you're like, a good company then already, <laughs> if, right? <laughs> if, I'm in, if I'm in a theological fight, I'm going to take those odds and uh, mm-hmm. and go with it. But here is here here is very briefly, you, you know, like my take on sin, which I think then leads into even the conversation about hell that you had. Yeah. The, the technical theological term is that grace is prevenient, <laughs> that we actually, we encounter God's grace. Yeah. We are rescued by God's grace. And only having encountered and been rescued by God's grace, only after that do we realize what we were rescued from. Yes. So... The way that we tell the story, particularly in Western evangelicalism, is we wander around our lives, and and we are sinners, and we're lost, and we're trying to find hope, and then one day we find Jesus. And so if you've been around church as long as you and I have, we remember reading tracts that phrased it that way. Yeah. We heard sermons that phrased it that way. But the thing that's really difficult is that was never our experience. But none of us encountered it that way. What we experienced first was the love of God. Yes. It was the grace of God. Excuse me a second here, Phil. I have this horrendous COVID cough that is just killing me at the moment. Um, so I'll, I'm I'll, over I'll talking on the previous thing. <laughs> per- because purposely, because I saw you coughing so much, I thought I, I can't stop now. <laughs> and, and so, so what, what, what happens is we then start to retell our stories differently. Yes. And then impose on others... We impose on others that they must now fit into the new model that we've created, even though it isn't the model that we experience. Experience, right? totally, totally. And so, so now, my Romans professor, uh, he explains this as the difference between prospective and retrospective theology. Mm. He says, and what we all want to do is prospective theology. Here's where you begin, and this is where you're going. But because my, my professor was a Pauline scholar... He says, well, let's look at Paul's life. Mm. So what does Paul say about his life before Jesus? He says, blameless, flawless, excellent, you know, <laughs> Pharisee of Pharisees. You know, he says, Paul's biography pre-Jesus is stunning as far as Paul's concerned, right? Yep. And, and then what happens? Does he realize he's a sinner? Nope. Does he realize that he's hopeless and lost? Nope. But he meets the resurrected Jesus. <laughs> he meets yes. the end of the story. And he goes, well, and basically... This is the way Douglas Campbell used to say it to us. The gospel isn't a question asking you for an answer. The gospel is an answer asking you to wrestle with the question. <laughs> and, uh, oh, man. So, n- number one, let's just all pause here and, and say David finally let us know that it was Douglas Campbell who was saying these things. Amazing. But So, Heschel, I use this quote with this is... Uh, deeply related and and is the heart of his depth theology thing i use this all the time with students that the question that you ask and this is this is heschel is a question you are being asked Mm. that you Mm. finally come to realize that all of your questions of god are actually god's questions to you Mm. and so this is the you know this is the thing for me where it's where it's you know, you get you get nervous, I guess, David, of being misunderstood when you talk about, you know, pagan mm. students and this and that. Goodness, I am deeply Christian. <laughs> you know, the, the cross is what, and this is what I'm trying to drive home. The cross has to be the vision. But there are, there are students, there are people who are deeply different from us. And they, mm. they have all kinds of questions, but there comes a point in our lives where we realize that all of the questions that we have of God uh, are actually God's question of us. And as Heschel says, that our mm. life is a question mark. Will we respond to the God who has already invited us, to the God mm. who is already calling us and dwelling us? As Christians, we say, this is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, crucified, born of the Virgin Mary. But these, we are able to name it later. And the point is not that, well, none of that actually matters. No, 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 no. (laughs) The only reason we can say any of the things we are saying about the boundaries and all of these things is precisely because we are following Jesus and looking at the Jesus who tore down these boundaries. And so the the more I'm able to talk this way is precisely because I'm following Jesus. 
and I realize I can't say any of the things I'm saying if it were not for the death, the life, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. It's all Jesus. And this is more than anything what I want to do is point and say to people, and this is my point about witness in the question, Mm. was witness is not... Let me tell you about, you know, the Romans road or, or you know, whatever. I, I've never actually done it, but it's not, it's not that. It's not formula. What it is, is when people sense the tap of God on their shoulder, hmm. when they realize, when they see the light, like Paul saw the light, and a blinding light, by the way. And this is what the mystery hmm. of God is. It's a hmm. blinding. It's not a graspable, you know, we say I once was blind, but now I see, which is true. But there's also another truth. I once thought I could see and now I was blind, but it's, it's the yeah. light which blinds us, right? But to be able to witness and testify, this is what witness is to me, is hmm. when people say, you know, well, the reason I joined, you know, this or that is because I believe that there was more in the world. And now I say, can I tell you about my experience with Jesus? And so I, I think more than anything for me is it's always wanting to bring it. It's, it's starting with Jesus and ending with Jesus. That, you know, I just, I love that point in Romans about the question. And that's, I think what I'm, tr- mm. what I was trying to get at in the whole sermon without actually saying it is all the things that we think we're asking are actually underneath of it all is the question of God, which is drawing mm. us by the power of the spirit to Jesus, so mm. yeah, and it's interesting because that I was that actually segues slightly into the question that you were posed on Sunday morning about about this nature of the harrowing of hell. Because right. I was reading, I was I was just is that reading, anywhere in the Bible, by the way? Yeah. Oh wait, in the book you're <laughs> preaching from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah. Um, my bad. Yeah. So yes, Ephesians four. Of course, you have it, don't you? This this sense yeah, that yeah, Jesus yeah. is, you know, is descends in and, and, and preaches. Now, here's here's the piece that I think is interesting. Uh, this is just me um, riffing off Bart again in his dogmatics and outline. Never a bad he says thing. That, absolutely, great little book, by the way. Everyone should read it. They, and it's rare that you can say Bart and Little Book in the same oh, sentence. Wait, okay. <laughs> you're saying the outline, not uh, not uh, yes. oh, yeah, church yeah, dogmatics. No. Okay, no, I thought you were like dogmatic. making a joke there. <laughs> okay, oh no, yeah, not the million Fair words enough. of church dogmatics yes. or some whatever it is. It's, it's, whatever, yeah. it's insane, whatever it is. Yeah. In his small book, Dogmatics and Outline, he says this, that, that, that what you get when you start to talk about hell in the Bible, he, he just says, he says, the Israelites thought of this place as a place where humans continue to hover around like flitting shadows. And the bad thing about this being in hell in the Old Testament sense is that the dead can no longer praise God, they Mm. can no longer see his face, and they can no longer take part in the Sabbath services of Israel. It is a state of exclusion from God, and that makes death so fearful and makes hell what it is. Mm. So he then, he then says, you know, the, that, that humanity is separated from God means being in the place of torment, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Our imagination is not adequate to this reality, this <laughs> existence without God. The atheist is not aware of what godlessness is. Godlessness is existence in hell. What else but this is left as the result of sin? Mm. And then what he does is he goes on to say, this is why Christ's descent into hell is so important. Because in the in the framing of of theology, essentially, yeah. nowhere is left exempt from God. This is why the harrowing of hell is so important. Because it is the the cross and its full extent, essentially. Yes. Of of everywhere is impacted by the cross. Mm. I, I don't know what you think about that. Absolutely. I mean, you know, before this, kind of the day that you were talking to me about the the sermon you mentioned Wolf and this is one of the things that Wolf talks about is is the arms of Jesus how they're spread out um, in either direction kind of reaching out eternally to all but the, yeah I mean this is this is the thing and goodness we have text for this <laughs> mm. what can separate us from from the love of God nothing can hell? No. There is no place where the love of God is not Jesus. The cross impacts every every place of existence or yeah. you know, however we want to speak of that. Yeah, absolutely, David. And so it sounds weird. Like I really appreciated the honesty of the question on Sunday. You yeah. know, of well, I don't I don't know that I recall hearing that in the Bible. 
Yeah. And in one sense, yes, there are those minor verses here and there, you know, Ephesians 4, as you mentioned, the one Peter text, as you mentioned on Sunday. But theologically, there's a bigger theme within it that speaks to everything we're talking about in Centred Set, which is why it was so cool that the person brought the question up. Yes. Is that the bigger theological thing is, is there anywhere you can go to get away from God? Which the psalmist, of course, had already made the point, even if I made my bed in the pit of hell, That's right. would be there. If so, I go so to the heavens, not... you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. Absolutely. Yeah, so this is not like heretical new theology. It's all through no. the Bible that that you can't get away from God. So when we confess the descent to hell, we're reminding ourselves that we cannot get away from God. And I just think that's beautiful. It's it's just, it's stunning. It's, you know, we often talk about, you know, we have this bad theology about God hiding God's face from us, all these types of things. Whereas, uh, goodness, we can turn our backs. God never turns God's back on us, ever. And that is what God is like. That is what God is like. God is a God who never, even in our worst moment, gives up on us or turns God's back on us. Yeah, yeah. I love that line in, in, in and I'm going to embarrass myself now, it's in one of the Timothys where it says that, that God can be many things, but he cannot be faithless because he cannot deny yes, himself. Yes, deny and, himself, um, yeah. And I think, I think too often our theologies of hell are built are built the wrong way around again. And, and that's, it's, it's, it's a weird non-Christian way to do things, actually. Mm. What is the answer? And let's build the problem backwards. You know, if nothing yep. can separate us from the love of God, if God is relentlessly set on pursuing us, why do we insist on building theologies? And I thought you spoke to this beautifully on Sunday morning. Why do we insist on building theologies and apologetics that present to people, well, the first thing you need to do is you got to escape this God who wants to send you to hell. <laughs> and it is just not a biblical way to construct an introduction to Jesus. <laughs> you know? And the person, who, the, the person who often leads us there is precisely the child. You know, Dustin, is, the, my son has asked me those kinds quote. of questions. Yes. Yeah, my son has asked me those questions all the time. Like, th- these exact natured questions. Mm. And I think it's David Bentley Hart who says... It's actually children who lead us back to these. And so, yeah. look, you know, it's not a... There are some things to wrestle with here. And, and mm. you know, it's not like you or I are, are telling people, here's where you need to land on it. But we're really? saying, goodness, scripturally, you still have to reconcile <laughs> with things yeah. that are in the Bible, which, by the way, people have always... I mean, this is the funny mm. thing is you say this and people are like, what is this newfangled theology? It's like... Oh, goodness. Can I point you to somebody, you know, 1,600 years ago? Like, or should we talk about Gregory of Nice or, or these different... Like, the, yeah. the church has always wrestled and said, these are expansive questions. But again, when we wrestle with them, it's coming back down to the foundation of, of what is God actually like. And that question is there uh, and informing our answer whether we know it or not. And, uh, you know. Well, and, and <laughs> to sound like the New Testament scholar that I pretend to be sometimes, Phil, like 400-year-old theology, 1,600 years John of Patmos writing Revelation, <laughs> behold, he holds the keys to death and hell, right? Yes, so, yeah. So, so God has taken, Jesus has taken the keys to death and hell from the yeah. Satan, right? Satan. Satan may be in hell, but he doesn't, he doesn't have rights to the door, right? You know, so, right. So, so at very least, whoever's controlling all of this, Right, and this is, and that, now let me go back to more safe space. Like, I can't believe I briefly quoted Revelation. Let me go back to Paul. Right? But, <laughs> but think about, but think about, you know, just think about it. You know, this sounds hugely heretical, but Revelation has Jesus holding the keys to death and hell, and then Paul comes along, and says, "Well, who is it that will condemn us? Well, is it going to be Jesus, <laughs> the mm, one who, mm. the one who died for us? Who is it that's right. judge? God, the one that sent Jesus? Like, you know, is it like the one who is the judge is our Father, and the one who could condemn us is our Savior? <laughs> like Paul's yeah. laying out. Well, well, this is a mystery, right? It's like, but it's somehow, mystery. even though we're dying like sheep all day long, Paul says, nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So, yes. So we've got to. Like, that is a theology that needs to be wrestled with. And yes. 
So, and it doesn't matter. We could get lost in a big conversation about what do we actually believe happens in hell, you know. And and it, again, it becomes it becomes a tool to bash people with, you know. Yeah. You know, like you, like I want to confess, there is like this is where I stand on this. The cross is the only hope for the world, right? But I also don't want to box God into into believing that only if people jump over my fences is God going to accept them. And that's where we get ourselves in trouble. Yeah, the cross is boxed into this little space over (laughs) here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm with you. So I think I think let's leave it there for this evening, Phil, because you and I could probably keep going uh, for hours longer. My yeah. my illness is is basically shutting my throat down. So I think maybe that's the cue. You know, maybe this that's what be people have been waiting for all this time. That David can't talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'd be both of us, bro. <laughs> but. No, I, I, Phil, I really appreciate the conversation. I, I think, you know, to, to journey even just explore some of the bigger thinking behind what you were saying on Sunday. Thank you so much on so many levels for the conversation today. Yeah, a joy, man. This was, this was fun.